Okay. All right, guys, how would you like to start? Yes. Any question? <laughs> you'll, be you'll be very busy. Uh, you'll be very busy. Uh, I can tell you that you got five questions. Each. Yeah, you can say, yeah, roughly, yeah. How many marks? Okay, I don't mind telling you. Ah, that's a good guess. Two hundred fifty. Well, of course, you'll be graded out of two hundred fifty and see the percentage, right? In some way, making so many marks make it easier for us to uh, find, uh, you know, somehow to give some part marks. Yeah, be easier. So I think that that'll be to your advantage. And then. Um, I think uh, somehow, I think the coverage wise, it's pretty balanced. I think uh, you really cover almost everything that we cover in the course. I would say math review, uh, model checking, LTL, program verification, and also assertions is a big part for the exam, assertion. And you definitely want to also review the lab exercises. The only one I wouldn't go so much will be lab number one. Lab number one is mainly about how to use the tool, right? Lab number three. Okay. I would say for that one, what you should really focus on would be the main lesson that you're supposed to learn from the different versions about what kind of properties you can check on the algorithm. Okay. Look. Yeah, look them up. Yeah, the four different versions. And look through the instruction for lab number three again to see what's really the main messages you want to get. And then for each version there, try to understand just based on what's really told over there about you know meaning of the syntax, you know how this algorithm is supposed to work, and yeah, I think at the end of section nine, there is a reference to something called Peter said. You don't need to worry about it. I think the lab instruction also said you don't need to worry about it. Okay. Yeah, other labs as well. I think for lab number four, I just released a solution. I definitely would ask you to really program Sudoku. Not really, right? That's uh, that's too much. But I would say, uh, in your lab number four instruction, I was referring to one of the earlier lecture. I think that's only about a few minutes about what, how things are supposed to be understood in general. Take a look at that. Okay? If I ever put any question on there, it could be related to it. Okay? And let me say a little bit more just before I forgot. Um, yeah. Okay, that's good for now. Patrick. Something like that. Something mm -hmm. about that right? Of course, I may not give you Sudoku again. I might give you something else. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Yeah, apparently if you compare, uh, let's say lab number two and lab number three and four, we are writing different kinds of assertion, right? In lab number two, it's more like a post condition that we did or precondition. We, did, we didn't really practice much. But for lab number three, it's more like uh, temporal properties, right? And also for lab number four, it's more about using some kind of property that can find, help you find a solution. Understand the idea there. I think it's good beyond this course anyway. Okay. It's more challenging. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you all truth. Either I will reject your response, respond otherwise everything I tell you is the truth. So, okay, one thing I can give you some tips about how you're supposed to answer the question. I really try to organize the question in a way that's more like uh, in the increasing level of difficulty. I think uh, you should definitely try the beginning question first, but I think it wouldn't hurt. Maybe after the first question or two, you can flip the question around to see how exactly uh, the question are roughly like. I don't think there should be any surprise to you what you're supposed to do, okay? And, and you can decide what really to answer first, okay? And thanks to Chidalu, I think uh, you guys are gonna get an exam answer booklet. So I got a question booklet. I got three uh, pieces of paper for you can sketch, okay? Oh, one thing I can just mention, since most likely everybody will watch this video. So, um, so there will be uh, three things you want to make sure you turn in at the end of the exam. So there will be number one, the questions booklet. 
And for that one, you can feel free to sketch anywhere you like, as long as you can find space. But there will be three, uh, append uh, three appendix pages for you to sketch anyway. So make sure you submit them, okay? Of course, make sure you put your name, student number, you know, et cetera. The second thing you have to submit is the, of course, the actual answer booklet, right? And the other one will be uh, answer booklet. Okay, very important. Do not sketch in this one here. Everything there is supposed to be graded. Oh, I'll, I'll get to you. Do not sketch. If you ever want to plan your answer, do it over here, okay? And the num uh, number three, and uh, I'll get to Chitalu about his question. Number three will be your data sheets. You gotta submit it at the end too. And also the data sheets. And all three, make sure you put your name and student number, every, every one of them, just put in the beginning, okay? Okay, your ID, your name, every one of them, right? If we miss any one of them from you, we wouldn't grade your exam. But of course, we'll remind you during the exam too. Chitalu. Yeah, I'm thinking because I don't want to give you any false information. No multiple choice like what you saw in the written test one or two. The only, I would, I'm not sure if you would consider it as a multiple choice. It's more like part A, tell me yes or no. And part B, justify. That's the only kind of multiple choice you will see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you can't do like <laughs> <laughs> You know, I think uh, the original intention is, let's say you guess about part A, right? Let's say you don't have no idea how to do the question, at least you can guess for part A, yes or no. Let's say you guess, and then you guess right, I'll give you partial marks. But somehow you answer something that's nonsense for part B, of course, we may give you zero. But you still get some partial marks from that question. Like we'll still read it. Well, we're still, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, uh, uh, of course, we wouldn't just grade by how much effort you spend. That's not supposed to be the way to go. But I would say, let's say you answer part A wrong, totally wrong, right? So either yes or no. And then I think that our instructor TA will also look at your part B to see how you're answering. Maybe there's some valuable thing we can get and give, give you some partial mark. But I'll get a judge case by case. Oh, one more thing. There's also some... I'm pretty sure somebody will actually uh, would have followed this, but I would suggest that will make the TA life easier. Let's say on your answer, book, uh, answer booklet, sorry, I don't have an example here today, but anyway, you may have seen that in other course, answer booklet. It's completely blank, so don't worry too much about following the answer, uh, like a question order. If you jump or randomly uh, randomize the uh, order, that's okay. I'm gonna ask the TA to do that. That'll be to your advantage. But the only thing I ask you to do is make sure, for example, let's say question 2C, make sure you identify that ex explicitly, okay? If I were you, I would even bring some highlighter. For example, it's a yellow highlighter. I can simply highlight, easy for the to see. That one's optional, but if you can, try to do that. Okay, any other question? Jora. For the answer or for the exam? Uh, for the, for the uh, sorry, the question. Okay, qu uh, I can tell you the exact number as so I remember, right? But that one there, okay. Don't be too scared by the actual number because the, I don't really put a completely all text within each page. Sometimes I clear the page, so it got lots of space for sketch. But I can tell you, if you, well, I can tell you since I know the answer. 16, however, however, let me explain, okay. One cover page, right? And three sketch, yes. Okay, you got uh, you got eight, right? Eight pages. I would say you should really take the seventy-five percent of the eight pages. Oh, did I miss something here? Uh, oh, I got it. I got it. Sorry, I got it. So this one here, I got it. Sorry, I was confused myself. Yes, exactly. There should be six. There we go. So think about each, each, each piece of paper got two pages, right? So like eight pieces of paper, to be more precise. So you got three, uh, three pieces of paper for sketch, and then you got four pieces of paper for questions. And also you got a cover page. 
Yes, that's correct. But I think uh, you got also plenty of space uh, to really sketch. You can feel free for the actual question. That's no problem too. Okay? I will think about Chidalo in my head. How can I not to dismotivate him too much? <laughs> okay, good. I like this change actually, guys. I'm glad you pushed me for this change. I like it. Oh, you know what? I can, uh, you know, I, I forgot to count. Uh, this is what I did. I think I will give you guys maybe one answer booklet to just to begin with. We'll see how that goes. And then if you guys need another second one, just raise your hand, we'll give you the second one. But just to be safe, uh, if you really need a third one, we'll have some spare one, just in case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at least you get two. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 you know what? If you're curious, I can show one example to you maybe during the office hour. That one, yeah, I, I do have some sample in my office. Yeah, I can show that to you. Yeah. Okay. All right, any other question? Yes. Coding question. For that one there, let me not answer you directly, okay? But I'll answer in this way. There will be a good part of the exam question that will require you to write in Pascal syntax. Whether it's for algorithm or for the assertion, like a, a you know, basically a programming test too, uh, get prepared. That's what I can say. You mean the programming practice test or the, uh, the uh, practice exam? Which one? The exam? I don't quite remember what, what I put on the practice exam. Yeah, that, that's possible. Yes, that's, that's about reading it. But you may also have to write it, right? Mm -hmm. Both. Mike. Yes. Oh, you no, know, no, no. It, uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure if I did give you some question for, for which you got to write the implementation, I give you the header already. You just have to write the actual implementation. Yeah. We wouldn't be picky on that header. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Jora. Not really, for the implementation. But, okay, how about this? This is a great tip. Good, uh, okay, now you guys pay attention. <laughs> okay. For post condition, make sure you really understand what post condition is supposed to do. Okay? And I believe if you can check back in your written test number two, I think in one of your questions, I think only one, that was about deciding whether the post condition should be appropriate or not, right? Review that definition for being appropriate. I think that might help conceptually. But I think the actual post condition in the, in the exam, those questions will really push you to think. Really, really. Mm -hmm. Yes? You mean uh, the programming test, the actual test? What I can do instead is to talk about it, sketch some idea. We can do that, how about that? I wouldn't give you the actual test or solution back because I might have to use it later, but I don't mind sketching the ideas a little bit. You guys can feel free to take the idea and then try to work it out. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll give Patrick first. <sighs> it's not very likely I, uh, because one of the TA, uh, actually, uh, two, uh, one of the TA was an undergrad student, so he was having some uh, exam before, so he couldn't really start until yesterday. And also, we were having some revision needed for the test values, so to really get it back to you before Friday is not very likely. That would be difficult, yeah, I, to, to know precisely. So that's why maybe the best I can do is to discuss maybe a little bit about both question there and then give you some idea what you should supposed to write. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I can give you some, I can sketch some idea, right? Okay, Sana. Can you just like, go through like, how to do those search statements with like, another question? Like, to do? Like a duplicate or something like that. You mean the assertion? Yeah. Okay, I can do that too. How about I talk about the, uh, the two uh, questions on your programming test two first. Okay, the first one, uh, if I, re oh, okay, I'm trying to recall. The first one is about encoding, right? Encoding something. Yeah, yeah. 
Let me just give you one example, and then we'll go from there. That one there, uh, let's say, for example, let's say the input is, let's say, uh, 1, 1, 2, 2, and 3. Let's say that's the input. And the output over here should be, oh, sorry, should be, so 1 should be repeated two times, and 2 should be repeated, repeated two times. Three should be repeated one time, something like that. Okay. 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 I would say for this question specifically, to really make it general, it's too complicated. I can tell you specifically for the general post condition without restricting the size of the output, it's too too much. So it wouldn't be on an exam for this one specifically. But let's see what we can learn from that particular one. Basically, you're going to look at Let's say, given the output over here, we can figure out the size of the input. Basically, what you got to do is, how many times numbers are going to be repeated, right? So 2 plus 2 plus 1 is going to tell you the size is 5, right? OK. So yeah, exactly. You can say length of the input is going to be uh, output at index 1 plus output uh, index 2 plus the, oh, thank you, absolutely. Yeah, that's why it's not too bad, but you will need some, you, you need some additional function to help you. You see, like a sigma function. I thought about doing it, actually, in your exam, but I found that to really just introduce that function and let you know how to use it, it, it will take too long. I don't think it's worth it. So that's why I decided to drop it. Yeah, you need some function like a sigma. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But let's not worry too much about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I really thought about it, but, but I'm glad I dropped it. Yeah. That one, I can tell you, that one there, for, for, for those of you who actually got how to use a sigma, it's not too difficult. But probably you'll spend more time understanding how to use the sigma than the actual question, which will lose the point. Uh, no, you cannot. Okay, oh, so in some, okay, I can also tell you, in some cases of the exam, it would, it would say if you want to write assertion, you should write in the math form. Sometimes you will write in valid uh, plus cal syntax, right? So either one. So, but the question make it very explicit to say which way to go, okay? Yes, if, if it really doesn't specify, it's completely up to you. Yes, but I believe I check it before I send it for print, but I could be wrong, right? But if it really doesn't specify, you can do anything. Okay, so what about part two? Okay, that's part one and part two. Okay, we want to talk about the contents. Does, does this also mean like the fact that the output is length six as a yeah, left-hand side of an input? Yes, absolutely, thank you. Yes, absolutely. If the length is six, yes, it I, I, I agree. Would you implies? Or implies. Yeah. implies. Yeah, sorry, I ah, actually. I thought it was a conjunction. Yes. Question for you guys, if I change this to be, rather than implies, what about I change it to conjunction? It's not the same. Because if the input, sorry, if the output doesn't happen to be of length six, in that way you will fail the whole thing. So it's like a special case, right? Uh, okay, forgot. Equal six, right? Okay. Okay, second part is about the contents. Again, we start with that antecedents, the length of output equals six, okay, that implies, all right? So let's talk about, for example, here. You can think about, uh, let's think about here. Let me just highlight this. Let's look at, only look at these two, okay? These two correspond to these two, okay? It is saying the odd index is talking about how many elements we have in this portion. And this part here tells you what every element is. Okay, I'll do one, you can do the rest, okay? It's going to be something like, you can say, for every, let's say I, I'll write in math form, okay? And then you can say one less than, or equal to I less than, or equal to, and how many times should we repeat? It's over here, right? So it's going to be the output at index 
1. And then it is the case that output, oh, sorry, exactly, yeah. When you are isolated, when it's quiet, it will be easier. Input at i is equal to, exactly. All right, think about this guy here. Yeah, very good. Yeah, think about output one, suggest over here. And if you got output two, it suggests about this guy here. Okay, and you can do the other fragment. Just another whole thing, of course. So that's why I'm gonna leave that to you to talk about other things. You need another two, which will suggest about this and this. One trick I can mention. For example, if you see two over here, it doesn't really mean you should start again from one and two. You should really offset with this particular, right? Okay, that's the trick you want to watch out for. All right, that's the encoding part. Okay. Chitalu. Mm -hmm. It's possible. So I'll make it very uh, explicit in the question itself. If I, I'll say either say invalid Pascal syntax, you write this assertion. Or I might say just write in mathematical form. Yeah, because I've noticed on the, on the test I try to do it like this. Sometimes, like, uh -huh. they don't let you put the implication, you have to put the semicolon with the colon. Yes, yes. Yeah. So I would suggest, yeah, to get yourself familiar about the uh, form. You know, we can do that in quick review. So something, something like, so in the math form, let's just say for all, you can check how they exist. For, let's say for every i, and then, for example, i is a, uh, let's say, natural number. And then, for example, i larger than or equal to zero, for example, right? What about the corresponding Pascal? Slash a, okay, yeah, and then i, i believe, uh, in, yes, exactly. Yeah, colon. Of course, if you happen to write this one larger than equal to, you'll be excused. That's fine. That's a small issue. Huh? Oh, you mean here? What? If, oh, wow. If you say assert, technically, you should really say semicolon, but you'll be okay. Yeah. Yes? Oh yeah, absolutely. So this is just one example, right? Yeah, so for example, let's say here, it could be, for example, another output you can try. It could be uh, one repeated two times, two repeated three times, and also one repeated four times. So you can see somehow the pattern for one has been broken over here. That's why you got you know, three different blocks for the output, right? Yes. Yeah, exactly. The, the order is not necessarily sorted. It can be any order, arbitrary. Okay? It can be any length. Yeah, this is one of the uh, uh, programming test questions I gave to 1022, right after you guys' year. Yeah, yeah. 1022, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think they also did some matrices, all the 2D matrices they did, yeah. yeah. All right, how about we do talk about also the second one, okay, briefly, okay. Uh, second one is something like, okay, the, the longest block, for example, let's say the input is here. Okay, so let's say, for example, let's say 2, 3, 3, 3, four, four, and five, okay? And the indices are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The longest block should be two, three, four, right? Over here, okay? So the output, i, should be uh, two, and j should be four, okay? Good, assuming that you're already uh, still fresh in your, in your mind, okay? Thomas, what would you suggest to put as post condition, if you remember? Well, we got two. You want to suggest anyone? Let's start with the easier one.
Mm, that might be a bit too complicated. Mm -hmm. So how about we start with this? Yeah, okay, F first of all, this should be a block that's valid, right? That's actually with all the identical. So this one I can write together with you for every i, that's a, uh, i less than, oh, sorry, not good. Be careful about choosing dummy variable, of course, right? Every k, let's say. Let's say i less than or equal to k less than or equal to j. And then, well, how about this? I'll write in this way. Let's say j minus 1. And then you can say, there might be a different way you can write it, but input, yeah. Equals input k plus 1. That's one way to write it. If you really want to find out a pairwise combination of the indices and say they're all equal, that's also fine. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for, for the first post condition, I think that this will be enough. You don't need to overkill by introducing nest, nested quantification. Yeah, so this one here, uh, this one here is about uh, I and J denotes a valid block. The second one is a little bit more complicated. Okay, I'll answer the question first. Uh, Chidalu. So, so, like, for all k, between i and j, yes. uh, input at k equals input at i, could that be wrong? Like, input at k equals the first one. No, that's correct as well. Oh, I see what you mean. I see what you mean. I see what you mean. Yes, yes, OK. Yeah, there are, there are many ways. So I think that that's why we got auto grading part, in which case you should pass, right, for the auto grading. <laughs> uh, unless you put, did something different, right? But I think uh, for the manual grading, the tier will read it too, right? Now I'll just write your solution if you don't mind, okay? I like that one too, simple. Yeah, I like it. That means every element is simply equal to this, right? That's good. Of course, you can also say J if you want to over here. Okay, that's good. Although you don't know how large I and J, right? Yeah, I think uh, it would be safe to, to put I and J. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, second one. Second one is about out of all the blocks, for example, here, this is another one. This is one. This is one. And this is one. One, two, three, four. Out of these four blocks where we got some consecutive identical elements, this guy here should be the largest. Okay? I'll give you a little bit idea. Okay? This one you may want to use uh, nested quantification. Okay? You may want to say for every, okay, so we got i and j. How about n? N. Okay? Somehow you want to say n, n denotes a valid block. Okay? And then, could be conjunction, okay? You can want to say somehow the size of the m, n block is less than or equal to the size of the i, j block. I think that's sufficiently good hints for you, so you can work it out. Yes? So would it have also been correct to say there is no larger block? You would say, instead of saying like this... You mean there's no block that's larger than i and j? Yeah. 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 Yeah, that, that will work too. Yeah. Basically, there, there are different ways to say this will be the largest. Either you say every block is less than or equal to this. Or to say there's no other block that's larger than this. Either way. Yes. I like it too. Yes. All right. So that's uh, the original request about programming test two. I think uh, that will give you sufficiently good hints. Right, you guys can collaborate, you know, today or tomorrow to see uh, how to put this in Pascal. Right, give it a try. Uh, yes. So which one? Sorry. So index one and index five. 
So, sorry, are you more talking about this one here? No. The first one, okay. What about it? No, because I and J denotes the longest one, right? Basically, we're separating into two post condition. Number one would be I and J at least denote a valid block. Number two, we say that denoted block is the maximum. We separate them. I could have, I could have asked another way in the programming test, which will make it a little bit di difficult for us to grade automatically. But in the exam, it's possible. Let's say you're given, let's say you're given this question here, for example, right? I might say use a single assertion. Okay, but if you can really work out these two conditions, all you got to do is this one conjunction with this. That's all you got to do, right? I'm already telling you the, the tip for tomorrow, right? For what, Friday. Mm -hmm. Yes. Can you like give us some kind of strategy to tell like quickly if like an arbitrary two formulas, which one is stronger? Okay, sure. Um, the, you know, Chidalo, the general tip, well, the question was, if you're given two formula, right? It could be you're given phi one and phi two. Well, it could be two predicate P1 and P2, right? Could be different, right? You want to somehow argue if one is, for example, stronger than the other. In this case, you're proving some implication. You want to think abstractly in the following way. Think about all the values that's going to make phi one true and all the values that go, that's going to make phi two true, are they somehow the sets that are subset of one another in one direction or both ways, okay? I know, but I think uh, if I really put, let's say, two formulas side by side, and the answer, for example, should be one is stronger than the other, you should be able to see they are quite related, right? You know, for example, if I just give you, yeah, FG, let's say, use that example. Let's say FI, and also G5, right? Which one should be stronger, right? You want to think about how many, for example, how many paths can really satisfy this versus how many paths can satisfy this? And this one is guaranteed to be fewer because if I got, for example, one path over here, uh, this many state, for example, maybe I got five here, I got five here, but not five. Apparently this kind of path will satisfy this but you wouldn't satisfy that, right? So that's how you decide. Yeah, so let's say if I, also, uh, if I really ask you about proof, uh, let's say, okay, there, there are different ways I can ask, right? I might say given phi one and phi two, right? I might say number one, which one is stronger? Yeah, for sure, why? Yeah. That's more like a guess, right, for the first part, right? Hopefully you're lucky you can at least get some right answer and get some partial mark, right? Number two, I would say justify. And I believe there are certain parts, not necessarily just this stronger or weaker. Whenever I say justify, sometimes I'll be emphasizing you have to justify it formally. In that, that means I wanna see some definition, I wanna see some proof, okay? So here, for example, formally. Uh, Jorah first, and then, yeah. So if you guess it wrong, you said, you said F is stronger than G for whatever, but your reasoning is right. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I think uh, we'll, we'll work towards your advantage. Let's say somehow you, you said, okay, phi 2 should be stronger. But let's say that's what you said in the part 1. But somehow you're trying to prove that phi 1 implies phi 2, which is right. In that case, I think uh, we, we, we definitely get uh, part one will be wrong, which will be maybe two or three marks. And for this one here, we might still give you marks. Yeah, there could be some very minor penalty because you're not arguing the same thing, right? <laughs> yeah, minor, minor. Yes, Patrick. Yes. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. Something like that. And I think, uh, like uh, in your example, exam question, 
So there will be emphasis about whenever you want to do some proof, if you can put it in the equational style, doing the equational style. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I know. That, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Do as much as you uh, do to the largest extent you can, and then if you have to continue with other approved strategy, that'll be okay. okay. We'll judge. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I, I remember. Wow. Do you guys remember what ARI is? Okay. You know, yeah. Yeah. Can you say ARI? Yeah, I think. Uh, okay. Let's say if you got, okay, you know, I'll make it fair. Let's say this, right? Let's say P2. Let's say this part of the step. I would say over here, you don't need to say ARI. Just briefly justify why you can go from P1 to P2. Well, it depends. If, yeah, yeah, I know. Well, you know, I, I think in some, uh, it's dangerous sometimes to say trivial, right? If it's a trivial over here, if TA myself, we don't think that's trivial, you're in trouble, right? If uh, you do some justification, I think that'll be better. Yeah, but sometimes we may agree it's really trivial. Uh -huh. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that's that one's fine. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's that one's trivial. So yeah, it depends on the cases. Yes. Yeah, I'll say individual step. You know, for example, let's say. Uh, if you got, uh, say, say for example, uh, let's say this. Let's say if you got not, let's say P or Q. I think over here you can either say De Morgan or you can say something like uh, we know that this one here is simply equivalent to not P and not Q. Right? In that case, you can put not P and not Q. That could be useful sometimes, or you can rewrite it as, for example, uh, let's say P yeah, implies Q equivalent to not P or Q, right? You can start from there too, either way, right? <laughs> Again, when you say clearly stronger, we gotta see. If uh, you, you have already justified a few steps and it's really clear that you're fine. If it's still not very clear to us, we'll say, oh, not that clear. So, you know, yeah, it really depends. And uh, the, the temper, the formulas won't be too nested. No, it wouldn't be too nested. Less than, more than too deep. Three more is a max. Like, is there anything more than too deep? That one, let me not answer. Oh. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, let me not answer. Okay. More than five? Let me not answer for that one. Yeah. 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 Thomas. Yes. Mm hmm. Okay, let's say for this one here, think about without a G, right? You basically just want to find one instance where you actually got maybe, uh, okay, let's say this. Think about P until R over here. In this case, you're basically saying R should be at some point true. And then the minimum requirement is for all the previous point, you must get P being true. Over here, okay, good. That one you know pretty well. And by introducing G over here, we're saying for every possible possible value, f oh, okay, it's like this. 
for every possible, it's continuously, continuously the case until it's satisfied. So for example, let's say you got R over here. In that case, we should really get P until over here. You might get another R over here. That'll be another instance. In that way, you should also get here also P. That's the difference, right? Mm -hmm. For every point where, yes, for, yeah, for every possible case where until can be satisfied, it must be satisfied. Mm -hmm. that, that's what the G really means, yeah. And, uh, yeah, exactly. So here, in the orange one over here, we got two possible instances for the until, right? This could be one instance over here. This can be another instance. Both of them should be satisfied to really make G, G true. Okay. Mm -hmm. that, that's one way to look at that. But I, 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 that's actually the way to interpret that. But uh, I'll be more safe by thinking that without a G, you just need one instance, right? But with a G, every possible instance of P until R, they should be satisfied. And then weak until we just also include P used to do mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Which one? Oh, you mean, okay, you're talking, okay, let's say we only got two instances, right? Let's say we only got these two. And for these two instances, we gotta check one by one whether P and also the P over here are satisfied. If they are, if they are then G will be satisfied, yes. It always has to be, depending on, how, depending on how many times R will be satisfied. It should be for every instance where R is satisfied, then P until R should be satisfied. That's what that means. Yeah, because itself is an infinite concept, right? Mm -hmm. hmm? Then would it not make sense? Because, like, like, the message mm -hmm. after the first R, you have P and R at the same point, right? Does it still make sense? No, we can tell, okay, if you change this one to be W, okay? So that means, you got, again, you still think about, you're considering each by each. So some of them, for let's say for this particular instance of R, if you want to satisfy weak until, you can either go for P, that's one case, or it could be that R is, well, or P will simply be satisfied forever. Right? That's another way to look at that. So this, so this is P until R or global? Or global, global P by definition. So Mm -hmm. So I suggest you guys definitely make sure you put the definition for the uh, operators. Okay, that'll be useful. Yes. From the top, like, like, does it imply GP? Like, does P will have to be true at every single state? Uh, G -g -g -g. Yeah. So sorry, Chidalu, say it again. Are you talking about this one here? Let me write it down first. No, the answer is no. I'll tell you why. Okay, not necessarily. For example, oh sorry. Let's say we got this one here. Let's say we got R over here. And let's say, let's say that's the only instance where R is true. And then let's say you got P here, P here, P here, everything up to here, P, but let's say not P over here. In that case, it will still satisfy P until R because it satisfy up to the I minus one point. But the fact that it's not P, it wouldn't satisfy GP, right? Mm -hmm. That's kind of the explanation you may want to write. If, for example, if I, if I really ask you this one here, it's too bad I cannot add this one to the exam. Yeah, that was, oh, that's, that's a good one. That's a good one.
not, yeah, not necessarily infinite, uh, infinitely often R, not really. It should say for every point where R is satisfied, then P must be satisfied in the previous so point. In the entire path, there's just one R. It's possible. So that would be a counterexample for this. Right? Mm -hmm. There's just one R, and there's not guaranteed to be P after. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. here, yep. Sometime after, there's no other R. Okay, so are we talking about this one here only, right? P until R. Okay, so that means, uh, oh, let's say if only this one here, that means we, should, we say there's at least one R where the P should be true from the beginning until I minus, I minus one point. Even if this point here, P until R, doesn't really satisfy, that's okay. You just need to find one. It could be another R is actually over here. In that case, that one there will satisfy P all the way to here. Think about this one here is finding just one. If you add this one, it's much stricter. It's to say whenever you actually got R being satisfied, then before that point, P must be always true. Okay. Hmm? Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah, so I think uh, it's def that's why it's so important for you to really get a formal definition written down on your sheets. Because when you're nervous or under pressure on the exam, you, you, could, you could forget or kind of get confused, right? For sure, yeah. Yes? Yeah. Okay. Again, if you, okay, if you look at just this one here, that means there should be at least one instance where R is satisfied, for example, over here. And then for all the previous points, P should be satisfied, right? That's P until R. But now you're saying globally. Globally means P until R should always keep happening. Okay? If P until R keep happening, that means, let's say I got R here, then this should be P until R. I got another R here, that should be another P until R. Right? Different instances. Do you right. uh, Yeah, that's fine. Here, we just say for every, right? So for every instance where R is actually true, right? Don't forget it for every. Do you right. Yes, I agree. Mm -hmm. they, they don't really do anything, yeah. You just say at some point R should be true. Well, let's say this, P until R, okay? This one basically is saying at some point, this one here should be established. The same, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. It must be. Yeah. Yeah, P U R, yeah. Yeah, but if you say P W R, it doesn't really require R to be there. If a P globally P, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, make sure you really understand U versus W. All right, make sure. Okay. Oh, one thing I really want to say, don't hate me too much on the exam day on in the following. I think uh, most likely I I'll still take your questions on the exam day. I know you might have some confusion. I will look at what we are asking, but most likely, I check my uh, question phrasing very carefully. Most likely, I'll just say, read the question again. <laughs> most likely. I'll be strict on this, okay? Just want to let you guys know. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. It was fine up until like, Part D, where you're getting into like the division, and once you went on the first branch, I got really lost. I so it's about maintaining the looping variant, right? Uh, Establishing or stated propagation from part C being the looping variant is maintained. We can take a quick look. Yes. Give me a moment. Yeah, guys, we can take another ten minutes, and then the office hour will also be there. You can also come. How about we answer his question first, and I'll get to you. Yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, I wish there's a way for me to rotate. Let me see. Oh, you know what? How about this? 
Give me a moment. There we go. And then, Thomas, just to be sure, you're talking about this particular proof, right? Okay. No, no, no. I'm going to do it. Uh, not here. Sorry. Rotate. Right. Okay. Can you tell me which part you want me to go over? Which part? Are you okay? Uh, are you okay up to here? This part here. Okay. Okay. That's okay. Why don't I do the following? I'm not sure if that might work, but let's give it a try. Okay, let me see if that might work. Okay, that works. Okay, so Thomas, you said you're okay until over here, right? That was fine, okay. So that's the calculated result for WP. And for your information, what I'm talking about now is the practice exam question. Uh, part C about maintaining the looping variance. Okay, okay, just in case. All right, so here, okay, I see. Uh, okay, so are you okay with this statement here? Proof that the precondition is no weaker than the above calculated WP. Yeah, exactly. WP of SR, right? We have done this already, which is over here. And we are trying to prove this implication, okay? So the Q is over here. Okay, let me just do this over here. Okay, so there are two parts. Uh, this part over here is the Q, the precondition. This part here is the Q. And this part over here is the state condition, right? That means we still stay there, okay? The B, okay? And then we are basically saying this and this, well, if you look at the whole triple, let me be more precise. It's basically B and the precondition there, and then whatever the statement it is, we want to establish R. And we calculated WP for this, right? We calculated WP. We want to make sure this thing here implies this. Okay, good. So think about B here is the B here, and Q here is over here. The whole thing should imply the WP. And the WP here is a conjunction, okay? If I want to show P implies Q and R, it would be equivalent to, I can show P implies Q first, and also P implies R. That's kind of implicit, right? So we can do one of them first. And this one is for exercise for you, right? So that's what we started with. And then for shunting over here, we simply combine. You can see implication here. We combine this, this, and this. So these are the three. One, two, and three. They are not the antecedents. And we want to prove about this. And this is actually what Patrick just said earlier. Can you use uh, and assuming the antecedent? Yes, you may. Like what we show here. We assume number one, number two, and number three. Okay, and we are, by assuming these three, we are we are now trying to prove that this thing here should be reduced to ultimately true. Uh, at what point can we assume any, any program we can assume the antecedent? You can always, yeah. Always. If yeah, if you want to prove, yeah, assuming the antecedents, well, let's say, if you want to prove P implies Q, right? You can say uh, assume P, then show that. Q is actually true. You might be debating yourself. I'm not too sure if you are. Should you put the entire proof on your data sheets? 
Yes, I, I can tell you what we think about it. Do I, want to, do I want to risk if this question might appear on the exam? If it is, you're lucky. Then you can just uh, copy and paste. That's good. On the other hand, if it is not, in that case, you might be wasting the space of your data sheet. Think about it. Okay. I would say, yeah, for this one here, if you, yeah, yeah, I would say maybe think about the, the critical maybe properties or lemma that are being used over here, and maybe put those on your data sheets just in case you have to use them, right? Vanessa. Shunting? Yeah, sure, of course. I'll make it a little bit bigger over here. Oh, yeah, sure. Think about this one here, okay? Let's say this is what you got, right? It's more like a nested implication. In that case, we, we can combine the antecedent P and antecedent Q, and that implies the goal. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like what Patrick said, you can either say assume, assume P and then assume Q and show R. And then here you assume P and Q, which is P and then Q, right? So just something is just sticking You're basically removing the implication, you're removing one of them and combining them, right? Ah, okay, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Yes, whatever. Mm -hmm. I don't think for, uh, I don't want to say for sure, but I think uh, if I recall correctly, most of the steps you will need to do any proof should be already covered by some of the exercises we have seen, I believe. Of course, if there's anything that's outside of what we have covered, you can use arithmetic where we can prove something aside, right? Actually, Dalu. Yes. Uh -huh. On the exam, it won't be like, like law fees like tools that we haven't seen before. Uh, well, well, I would say whether you really call it shunting or not doesn't really matter. Okay, if, it? yeah, if, for example, something like this. Yes. It will be totally acceptable. Let's say on the exam, rather than saying shunting, you simply say it is known that this is a theorem. That would be enough. You don't, you don't really have to remember the word shunting. It doesn't need to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions? Jora. That one I cannot really answer, but I would suggest any uh, site uh, lemma or property you may have to use, I think you have already seen them, most of them. They, if they, okay, let's say, I'm not recalling precisely. So let's say if you really want to go show that P equivalent to Q, that's one of the steps you're wondering if there should be. If you really believe there should be, in that case, you can put some justification here, but to be safe, you can also try to write something additional that's you know, trying to show that they're Equivalent, it could be. That's how I would do. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Oh, you mean here, right? You mean here? Uh, this, this guy here. Yeah. Yeah. To be well defined. Sorry. Uh, WD, well defined. Well defined. Well defined, yes. I'll, I'll write it down. Could you just explain that? Uh, sure. The reason is okay, so if you look at, for example, whenever you got, let's say, um, let me give me one moment. Okay. If you look at looping variance, okay. The looping variant goes something like, I'll actually write it down quickly. For every j, j between, oh, sorry. Uh, j, a member of one dot dot i implies 
input i larger than or equal to input j. So Thomas, that's the original looping variance without the amendment, without it. Okay? So the idea would be whenever you have any indexing operation, this is one, and this is one. You want to make sure the expression there is well defined. In 33, uh, 3342, what Roden will do is to generate some extra proof obligation for you to discharge. But for this course, you gotta generate it yourself. But I would say the only thing you have to generate for yourself will be this kind. That, that one I can tell you, okay? So you can see that here, J kind of depends on I, right? So that means we only have to look after I over here. In that case, you will generate to say, I should be a valid index. That's why we got this one here. Yeah, I should be valid, and also J should be valid as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think uh, here. Uh, yes, because I here is actually part of the uh, loop counter. I think it was handled somewhere else. So here we're just handling the dummy variable. If it depends on I, we already handled yeah. I, mm -hmm. have to handle J. It's J, yeah. So this is a dummy. That's, that's why you gotta handle that. But, but, but if it depends on a variable we've already handled, then why do we have to handle it again? Like you, you kind of said it, but it yeah. depends. Yeah, yes. Sometimes the, uh, the amended expression you put over here may be useful for later proof, sometimes. Sometimes it may not. So it's good to introduce that right first. And then, if they're not useful, you can drop them later. When I say draw, I mean just somehow you can use it or not to use it. That's what I meant. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Natural language, what do you mean natural language? LTL to natural language. LTL, yes. How are you going to basically mark it? Because like it's hard to it's hard to determine whether like uh, what you wrote in LTL really can actually capture. Uh, okay, so there, there are two there are two uh, there are two questions here basically. Okay, so two possibility. Either I will give you some English, and then for that one you formulate it into LTL, or you give it some LTL and then kind of explain what that really means. So both are possible, okay? Let's say for this one specifically, the natural language you're given itself should be made quite explicit about its context. It should be quite obvious about what should be the, uh, I mean, obvious what should be the requirement you have to encode into the LTL. It should be clear enough, I believe. On the other hand, if you want to go from LTL into English, right? For that one there, we want to see how well it can express, you know, about giving some LTL, for example, right? How would you explain, let's say, F, G, phi, right? How would you say that, for example? How would you describe this? Yeah, I think that's pretty reasonable, right? So that one there, just for us to see if you can really capture the essence of the formula. My question is, like, I would say, you know, again, so for the question itself, I would, I would have thought about how students might answer that, right? So maybe for the standard solution, I might have multiple solutions there and let the TA know. And then any additional assumption you should, you should really uh, encode into the formula, I would have mentioned that. If I really didn't mention anything, they are pretty much free to encode anything that's consistent with the original description. And then we will be a little bit flexible about grading them, depending on how, how far distracted you are you know, for the uh, formula. Right? Mm -hmm. In math, for alls are kind of omitted. Like when you make a claim, if you say i is greater than zero, it's implied that it's like for all i. Mm 
Mm -hmm. In English, it's not really the case, right? So in, in those situations, like, there's ambiguity. Because like, if you say, like, I shave before I leave the house, it can be interpreted both ways. Like, it could be interpreted that I always shave before I leave the house, or it could be just now I shave before I leave the house. I think, yeah, again, I think that uh, you talk about English to LTL, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, in that way, I, I try to make sure the English part should be very, very uh, uh, straightforward and also explicit about what implicit assumption you should really handle. Should be good. If there's anything you think that's not clear, write down your assumption beside your answer, and then we'll consider that when you read your answer. That, that will be the best way to go. Yeah. Yes, oh, Thomas first, and then I'll go to GRI. Again, you don't need to memorize that. You do have a, some data sheets for you to put some stuff in. Uh, I would say, you know, like header for algorithm, header for uh, you know, different stuff. The header, you don't need to memorize it. As I said, I'll only, only ask you to write the critical part, either for the implementation or to declare some Boolean property, et cetera, right? Maybe uh, if I were you, I would just to maybe put down the operators, which I can forget about how to write in Pascal. Like how to write for all, how to write, how to write exist, how to write conjunction, disjunction, you know, things like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, Jara. Yes, in Pascal. Yes. Yeah, that's one way to do, or yes, I see what you mean. Yeah, let's say for this one here, let's say for Eng from English to LTL, if you think about the example we did in class, I might say maybe P represents something, Q implies some, uh, represents something, and the LTL might just be P until Q. That could be one way. Or another way could be, the, from my description, it's obvious about what atoms you can actually use in the actual formula. You'll be obvious. You will see. You'll see in the exam. So I, wouldn't want to, I don't want to elaborate too much further. My point is, everything you would need to really answer each question should be in the question, uh, question itself. Should be. Mm -hmm. All right, guys, anything else? I normally don't really do what the people call curve. I will try to look at uh, where student might be when they are very close to a particular cutoff, and then to see if I should bump them up, right? Let's say Jora is only between A and A plus. Should I bump him up? Should I, or should I not? Okay, <laughs> we'll see how far it is. Can we vote? <laughs> Uh, you know, since we talk about theorem proving in 33.42 and model checking in this course, so I would say to really compare the two is definitely one. That's very important. And what's really mission critical versus safety critical. And also model checking, you know, LTL formula. And also the basic of a practical logic, how you can prove versus disprove, you know, different formula, which we did lots of example. And also program verification, that's for sure, using uh, whole logic. How many did I mention? That okay, that's fine. Yeah. Not necessarily. Uh, pretty much, you know, I think as I said, it's pretty balanced, right? Yeah, I think it's pretty balanced. Yeah. I think uh, all the, uh, I think all the questions I asked in the exam, I, we definitely covered them, you know, in reasonable depth and also exercises. So, yeah, Jora. Uh, so, for the, uh, question, yes. Let me, let me answer in this way. Let me answer in this way. 
a while loop with some if statement inside is possible. A while loop within which you got another while loop is also possible. That one there, I wouldn't answer for that. I wouldn't answer that. Okay, but huh? it nested is possible. But I would say this. How about this? My only tip for you: when you really see something complicated, read the question carefully to see if there's any anything you can simplify. Maybe the complexity first before you get onto there. Uh, you mean nested or? I don't have any example in my mind right now. Okay, um, but if you do have, I would suggest. The way to do this would be think more about. So let's say you got something before that, something after that. You handle them separately. When you handle this one specifically, for example, right? This one here. Okay. Think about. Oh, sorry. Let me just move a little bit better. This will be statement number one. Uh, face number one. This will be face number two. And then this will be face number three. Okay. But the whole thing over here would just be the body of the loop. So when you think about the looping variant for the outside loop, don't worry too much about the nested structure just yet. Think about what should be achieved when you finish the entire iteration for just the outer loop. That's how we think of it. So think about the looping variants for outer loop. That will be one thing, and then. Go back to the inner while loop, and then there might be another looping variant for the inner loop. Think about it separately. If I do give you something like a nested loop like this, the algorithm itself should be very familiar to you. It's not like a encoding or decoding that might be new to you for the first time. So the way to think about the looping variants is you can either start with the looping variant for this one first, or you can start with the looping variant for this one first. That's okay. Think about that kind of separately, rather than thinking about it's only a single looping variant that's going to handle both loops. That might be too complicated to start with. You mean the, for this one? Yeah, so somehow, yeah. So the starting states for this while loop should be whatever that's been finished from here. That should be the states. And that's something you may have to do some calculation. Yes. Mm -hmm. similar. Something similar, yes. Which we kind of discussed in the last class, I believe. Yeah, briefly. After the break, I still remember. Very briefly. So, say it again. I didn't quite. Yes. Well, I, I think uh, I, I believe I made it very clear in the question. But if you didn't see that, for example, if you got, uh, uh, you can assume as an algorithm, and then you might have in the beginning assert something over here about the input. At the end, you also got assert something about the output. Obviously, this one should be precondition, and that one should be postcondition, right? I think for most of them, I did put some comments about precondition, postcondition. In case no, it should be also quite obvious they are. Oh no, you don't include. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Only those that to do with uh, either the local variables or the output and input variables. That's correct. That's correct. So let's say to be more precise, for the S body, right? Let's say here, you don't include about the evaluation for V, the variance, and also the I, right? You don't include them. Which loop? It's a loop. Yes, indeed. 
it, it does. That's what I that's what I meant. Yeah. So you want to think about maybe start with this because somehow this loop works by itself, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you want to think about the invariance and variant for this one first, and then maybe it makes it easier for you to think about what should be the invariant and variant for this one here. Okay. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. That one there, okay. S body technically speaking for the while loop here should be this one here and this one the loop, yes, and also this one. But you may sometimes find it easier to break it down to do something like look at, look at the way we think about sequential composition. Think about what's the starting states right here. What's the intermediate states over here? That'll be the starting state for while, for which is like a precondition for the inner loop. Right? And then what's really the intermediate state over here and what's the final state here? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, it will be the actual body itself. It's part of it. Okay. I would say for the very tricky question there, it will be tricky for everybody. So you may have to want to take some time to think about during the exam because you cannot predict. But I would say before Friday morning, what I would do is go back to the basics and make sure you, the basics are really making sense to you. Especially the example that we talk about in the class and uh, lots of examples that we gave to you, you know, in the practice test and also the practice exam. I think there are many things to think through. And then I think that there will definitely be some tricky question in the exam, for sure. Will be, there will be. But I think that for a good part of the exam, they are also straightforward. There's no reason you shouldn't really get full marks for that. There will be some. There'll be quite many. Mm -hmm. Okay, kind of vague, but I think uh, that may give you some idea, right? Yes, sure. Oh, we talked about the the actual LTS, right? Oh, the model checking. I run that range. I run it. Huh? Maybe I wouldn't answer for that. Five, six, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't be like a like a very giant state machine, right? That you have to take a, a page to. Twenty will be giant, but it's not like but it's not like a twenty. It's not like a twenty. Hmm? Yeah, I, I that one maybe I wouldn't answer. I'll just get just get ready, you know, for checking the formula. And then if you really find that the machine itself is really complicated, it'll be complicated for everybody. If you can answer that right, you got the advantage, right? So it's a competition. Huh? <laughs> That's one way to look at that. If you don't like, you can uh, think, well, yeah, uh, there are many ways to look at that. But anyway. Chidalu, mm -hmm. any other question? I don't really, uh, by my gut feeling, I don't really have a formula. My gut feeling is you guys, you guys will get breezy, very busy. Right to the end. You might, you might be able to have some spare 15 to 20 minutes to check the final answer. I thought about that, it might be possible. But I would say, when I was a student, when I did the exam, I never thought I would get time to really check back. So when I answer that question, I answer properly as much as possible. If I really got some question, I'm really not too sure I skip them. Of course, you don't want to end up skipping everything, right? In that case, you gotta have a second pass. Yeah. I, I, I'm pretty sure there will be a good amount of question you can answer right away. And once you answer them, assume that you cannot really come back and check the answer, okay? There will be definitely questions that you have to put some thoughts. For those, maybe only answer them, you know, when you really have finished every other question that you think. Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. I really try to organize the question in a way that's kind of uh, the easiest one should really come first. But that's what I thought, right? Sometimes, you know, you might find what I th uh, find is difficult, you might find it easy, or well, the other way. So I would say maybe skim through the question okay. first.
Should I, should I give you guys one more tip to make you feel a little bit better? Okay. For evaluating the LTL formula, like what we did in written test one and written test two, I think we have done enough of that. So if you got anything like that, it would be just about the same level of difficulty, like what we did in the written test one and two. That might make you feel better. How you interpret that, I'm not too sure, but that's what I really meant to say. Okay. There might be some evaluation you have to do you know, on the model, in which case you can, it will be just about the same level of difficulty like what you did in written test two. That's what I can say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think I got almost everything, right? Um, almost everything in the, in the different the questions there. Like yeah, you know, to be, you know, that one I can answer, you know, for the introduction there, I cannot cover everything, right? That'd be t that's not really technical, but maybe focus on the more important ones, right? On the other hand, I think uh, for, uh, yeah, other, other technical content, I think uh, that everything's possible, you know, math review, LTL formula, and also program verification, they're all possible, right? Mm -hmm. All right, guys, any other questions? All right, if you come to my office hour, you're more than welcome to. I might just take a very brief five or 10 minutes break and then I'll see you there. Otherwise, don't be late on Friday. I know it's early. Okay, thank you.